All right. Well, as you know, we are going through the Ten Commandments because we know that our Lord Jesus Christ, I hope we would all agree, our Lord Jesus Christ kept these commandments. It's, it is the standard of righteousness, and He was absolutely pure and righteous, so we know He kept them. And we're looking at Him as an example of, of how we are to keep them. And again, Jesus kept them in order to merit justification for us. We don't keep them for that purpose, but we do keep them because it pleases God, because it honors Him, because it shows love to Him. So that's, we want to look at it from that perspective. And really, how can we show God love through the keeping of the Sabbath? Well, when we remember what the purpose of the day is, which is to spend with Him, I think it, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? God loves us so much, He commands us to set aside a day to spend with Him in worship and prayer and to spend with one another, building each other up in Christ. Um, how can we love Him if we don't take advantage of this day? You know, the thing that's nice about it too is uh, if you've ever been wrestling to find that time with the Lord and yet your life is so busy you don't feel like you, you can really justify it, well, here's the justification, <laughs> a commandment. To set, you, can, you can set everything else aside and not worry about that because God wants to spend this day with you. All right, well, let's look at the commandment and then we'll, um, we'll consider what it says. So first of all, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Uh, let me just mention one thing. I am going to mention it in the, the message as well, that there are two kinds of Sabbaths in Scripture. The one we're looking at is the moral commandment that was inscribed on the tablets of stone. But the other Sabbaths are ceremonial Sabbaths that don't necessarily correlate with this. They were additional ones that were connected to the ceremonial system. Those have passed away. Those are a matter of Christian liberty, whether you want to observe them or not. This one was engraved in stone and by the Spirit on our hearts so that we would keep it as our Lord Jesus did because we need it. Well, having said that, uh, let me just remind us that we've been looking at how Jesus loved His Father as a model to us of how we are to love Him. And we're looking at it specifically now with regard to His obedience to the commandments. Now, we saw that Jesus kept the first commandment. You know, the more I think about the first commandment, the more I, it kind of opens up to its true meaning. You know, Jesus took the true God as a man to be His God to be the one he would devote himself to and serve because he loves him most of all. He realized that if he were to put anyone or anything else before him, that that would be to be a servant of that thing. You know, whenever something, you know, ascends in our affections beyond God, that's when we begin to set God's commandments aside and to pursue that thing. This, this is telling us we need to put the Lord first. Jesus did that. We know that. He was absolutely perfect, devoted to Him, served and honored Him with His entire life. That's the goal, even though we're not going to attain it. That's, that's the goal in this life. He kept the second commandment, which is you know, worshiping the Father in the way that the Father tells us to, the way He prescribes. You know, Jesus, when He worshiped publicly on the Sabbath, okay, He was careful never to offer strange fire, and I hope you know what that reference is referring to, Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire. They did something that God had not commanded and God was not pleased, to put it mildly. Jesus never offered strange fire. He never did anything to displease His Father, but only those things that honored Him in His public worship and in His life as a whole, because all of life is to be worshipped or is to be worshipped to the Lord. He kept the third commandment, he, he treated uh, 
God's revelation of himself reverently in, in every possible way, and God reveals himself through the creation, he reveals himself in his word, he reveals himself through his names, and we saw something of that. But the most prominent way in which Jesus kept his commandment is he always spoke the truth, and he always kept his promises. You know, he knew the Father was bearing witness to him, and so he made sure he only said what he meant. And that's obviously what we need to be aiming at as well. So again, this is our example. We need to put God first in our life, be his servants, be devoted to him, and nothing else. Uh, nothing else needs to, you know, can come even close. Even the ones we love the most in this world are to be a far distant second so that they never override what God calls us to do. Uh, we need to purpose to live according to his will. You know, um, as Jesus said to the, to the devil when he was being tempted, uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we need to honor his name by keeping our promises to him. Now, this morning, I want us to consider how Jesus kept the fourth commandment. I thought we could begin by looking at the Sabbath in general. And you may not hear anything you haven't heard before, but it's a good reminder. This is my, again, my old, uh, actually it wasn't Old Testament, but what was the, uh, oh, uh, my teacher, one of my professors in college, I, he wore so many hats, it's hard to nail him down. But um, he always talked about how he had such a, a good forgettery and a terrible memory. You know, the shredder works great, but uh, he just can't, uh, can't remember the things he wanted to remember. Well, we need to re be reminded of these things, and we know Scripture tells us that we do from time to time. So first of all, what is the Sabbath? Well, the word Sabbath, I think you understand, means to desist, to stop, to, to rest. And when we're talking about the Sabbath day, what we're talking about is a divinely appointed day of rest. And as I mentioned, there were ceremonial Sabbaths, and there was the moral Sabbath. And what we're looking at here is the moral Sabbath, okay? The fourth commandment of the Decalogue. Now, God established this from the very beginning. It's, it's very interesting. You know, he, he, uh, he works six days and he rests on the seventh. Establishing it at the very beginning, at the end of the creation week, he tells us in verse 11 of our passage. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, the Sabbath day is the day of rest, the day that God rested. Now, I think you know that God did things the way that he did. He created in the time frame that he created because he was setting a pattern for us, a pattern for his creation. I mean, have you ever wondered why God took six days to do something he could have done in an instant? You know, Augustine wondered that too, and he said, God must have done it instantly because it wouldn't take him six days to do all this. So then, why does he describe it in six days? Well, merely to set a pattern for us. But I believe God actually did it in six days to set a pattern, okay? First, part of the pattern is that we would work for six days, okay? He says, six days you shall labor and do all your work in this commandment. Why? Because in verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, okay? God works six days, so we are to work six days. And I want you to notice this commandment isn't only about rest. It's been pointed out that it's also about work. It's a command to work. If we don't work, uh, Paul tells the, what, the Thessalonians, if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. We are not to be a burden on others. We are to work, take care of our needs, and if we're uh, fathers, we're to work and take care of our households, right? So it's a command to work for six days, and notice it's a command to complete all that work in six days. He says in verse 9, six days you shall labor and do all your work, just as God finished his work in six days, so are we. And the reason is so we can rest on the seventh in verse 10. The seventh day is a Sabbath or rest of the Lord your God. In it, you shall not do any work. 
And again, the reason is because of the pattern God set at the creation. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and rested on the seventh day. Now, I hope you understand that this rest that God took on the seventh day is not because he was tired of his six days of work and creating, okay? He tells us through Isaiah in Isaiah 40, verse 28, Do you not know? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth does not become weary or tired? You know, he didn't rest because he was tired, but he rested because he knew we would be, okay? After our six days of work, he did this to set a pattern for us. And he gave us this day out of his grace as a gift. Because again, that is what we need. Moses tells us in Genesis 2, 3, at the end of the creation week, okay, God blessed the seventh day. Now, he didn't do this for himself. He did it for us because we need this day. We need this day of rest to be refreshed from our work. But Moses goes on to say this. He also sanctified it. Now think of the commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. When God sanctifies something, that means he's setting it apart for himself from secular use to sacred use. So he sanctified this day, which means he set it apart from all the other days of the week so that on this day we would spend it with him, we would seek his face. I mean, man needs time to worship. We're creatures. When is that time going to be? How long is it supposed to be? Well, that's exactly what the Lord tells us. You know, there's this question, can you deduce the commandments from conscience? The moral law within, you know, can you find them all? Can you find the Sabbath? Well, you can. It's because we know we're created and we know that we owe our creator worship. But again, we don't know how often we're to worship him. We don't know how long we're to worship him. We need the commandment for that. But we do know there must be time because we owe him absolutely everything. Well, this is how we actually see it being used after the fall. I think you know uh, from the past that, um, and I didn't come up with this argument myself, it was in Edward Fisher's book, The Marrow of Modern Divinity. He argued that Adam and Eve were not really in the garden for very long. And we know that because God gave them the blessing to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There was no reason why they couldn't begin their family in the garden. But they didn't, and there's certainly no reason why Eve wouldn't have conceived in the garden. So really, the, they were in the garden a very short period of time. She conceives and has her first child outside the garden after the fall. But for whatever time they were in the garden, Adam and Eve were to, to tend it, they were to cultivate it. We know that's true. They were to guard it as well. But that work ceased on the seventh day of the week. They rested and they spent that time with the Lord. We have to assume that's the case because that's why the Lord established the day. But even after the fall, we see them worshiping. And it may not seem quite so obvious, but we read in Genesis 4, verses 3 and 4. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. Now, it doesn't seem obvious here, but if you look at the literal translation of the Hebrew for that phrase in the course of time, it reads this way, at the end of days. And as you look a little bit more deeply into it, the end is referring to the end of a definite, a definite time period, okay? The end of days. Well, remember at the end of the creation week, God established the Sabbath. And this appears to be, most likely, the end of the week or the seventh day. And on this day, Cain and Abel bring their offerings to the Lord to worship him because they knew sacrifice is what he desired. They knew that because God had given animal sacrifices for Adam and Eve as you know, a covering for their sins uh, after the fall, before they were excluded from the garden. So they knew how they were to approach God. They were to approach him through sacrifice. Abel brought the blood sacrifice that God required, but Cain, a bloodless sacrifice. And I think that's why Abel was accepted and Cain was rejected. But again, the, notice the idea is that 
definite period of time at the end of this cycle of days, they come and they worship God according to His command. Uh, we see a Sabbath observance. Now, we can't point to a definite example of the patriarchs worshiping on the Sabbath, but I think we should assume that they did. And I'll, let me give you an argument for that. Remember what God called Abraham to do when He called him into covenant with Himself? Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. Now, what did that mean to Abraham? Be blameless. If you had no understanding of the commandments at all, let's say you're, you're just, he's called out of paganism, he has no idea what God requires, and God says, I want you to be blameless. Well, God, what does that mean? You see, you have to know what the standard is in order to aim at that standard. And I think Abraham knew what God required, but he didn't ask him, Lord, what do you mean? What do you mean to be blameless? How did he know? Well, he either knew through oral tradition. You know, how did Moses learn about all the things he wrote about in the Pentateuch? There was oral tradition that was being passed down, plus God supernaturally intending by his Holy Spirit, making sure he recorded just, you know, just the truth. But oral tradition was certainly one way. Conscience was another. There had to be a standard. Otherwise, Abraham would know, really not know where to aim. You know, he would, blameless would have no meaning to him. So I think that Abraham and the patriarchs, we certainly see them worshiping. No question about that. It's just hard to say, well, did they do it on this day? If he's going to be blameless before God, that's what he needed to do. When God called his people out of Egypt, one of the first things he did was provide manna for them. And they were to collect that manna for five days and twice as much on the sixth day because on the seventh day there wasn't going to be any. And the reason was because that was his Sabbath. Okay, so we see the Lord bringing them out of Egypt, and one of the first things he does is he reestablishes the Sabbath. And then shortly after that, Moses goes up on the mountain to receive God's law, and God writes this commandment on the stone tablets, and he gives them to Moses that he might show God's people what his will was for their lives, what, what the enduring standard is. Reformed theology, again, I'll, I'll just use that as a, um, you know, sort of a summary of, of what the thinking is in, in this particular denomination, sees the commandments written on stone as being written on stone because they're permanent. You know, it's not like the ceremonial laws, which when God commands them, they must be kept, but they can be, they can be removed, you know, and God would not be any, any less moral because He does that. You know, if He says to you, I don't want you to wear clothing that's made of two fabrics mixed, well, then you better make sure you don't do that. That's, you're morally bound to do that because God commanded it. But God could just as easily say, uh, it's okay now. You can, you can wear clothing with two fabrics because there's nothing that's moral about that commandment except when God gave it, you had to obey it. But there are commandments that can't change. I mean, when is it going to be right not to have God as your God or when is it going to be right to worship him through images or in ways he hasn't required or to use his name in vain or to break his Sabbath day or to dishonor your parents or to commit murder or to commit adultery? You see, those are things that can't change. Those are things that are always moral and they won't change because God doesn't change. We still need that day and we're, we're going to look at that. So when we arrive in the New Testament times, we see the Sabbath continues. There's no question this, the Pharisees were keeping it scrupulously. Sadly, they were making it too strict for God's people. And you know that every time Jesus opened his mouth to speak about the Sabbath, and by the way, he spoke about it frequently, it was to correct their misunderstanding. Okay? But he never denied it. He never abolished it. He kept it. And he taught his disciples to keep it. He declared himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay? It was a part of the righteous standard that Jesus needed to fulfill to be our Redeemer. So there's no question about that. I think that's pretty plain. But the real question comes in, in, at this point. What about when Jesus' work is done? You know, when he's finished with his work, he's died, he's been buried, he's been raised from the dead, and, and now the New Testament times, you know, with the changes that are taking place between Old and New Testament times, now these things are rolling forward. The question is, is, does the Sabbath remain in force? Well, you know, there's a disagreement within the church as a whole 
on that particular issue, even, even within reform camps. So I think it's a minority report within the reform camp that some believe the Sabbath doesn't continue. In evangelicalism, it's almost universal. We don't, we don't need it anymore, okay? So the question is, why do they, why do they think that? Well, there are those who say, and, and by the way, this, this is a very common thing, and I've heard it many times. If, if you've told it to me recently, don't be offended if I repeat it. But our Sabbath rest is in Christ. You know, so I don't have to keep the Sabbath because I'm in Christ and I rest in Him. Now, there, there is some truth to that. We're going to look at that in, in just a moment. But they would take that argument and continue with a couple of other verses in Scripture. They would say, now, because Christ has fulfilled it, it's a matter of Christian liberty. You know, I can either keep it or not keep it if I want to. And they think that that's what Paul is saying in Romans 14, verse 15, or excuse me, verse 5. He says, one person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. Oh, you see, Paul says, you can, you can take it or, or leave it. And since it's a matter of Christian liberty, he goes on to say to the Colossians in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, that we are not to um, judge one another with regard to our observance of this day. He says this, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food and drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come but the substance belongs to Christ. By the way, I want you to notice the things that are grouped together there because they all have to do with the ceremonial law. Now, let me just say this. It is true that Jesus fulfilled the commandments. Yes, he did. And we do rest in him. We do rest in Christ with regard to the righteousness that we need to be justified. We don't have to work for it. We rest in what Jesus Christ has done. But we do need to remember that Jesus also kept the commandments to give us the power to keep them as well, didn't he? Not to give us the liberty to break them. Of course, Paul writes in, in Romans 6, verse 15, shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. We are not to sin in the new covenant, even though Jesus has kept the commandments, right? But how do we know what sin is? Sin is lawlessness, John says. We know it through the commandments. So if we break the fourth commandment, are we not still sinning? Thankfully, that sin is forgiven in Christ, but we still don't sin. The grace may abound. Now, further, Paul was not referring to the moral Sabbath. He wasn't referring to the fourth commandment when he told us that we can observe it or not or that we shouldn't judge others who do or not. He's referring to the ceremonial Sabbaths. Everything that has to do with the ceremonial law in the new covenant is a matter of Christian liberty. You know, you can either observe it or not. Remember how James paid for Paul's way into the temple and um, actually, he told, actually he told Paul to take four other men who were under a vow and pay their way so that he could show all the Jews that he was keeping the law of Moses. What law was he referring to? The ceremonial law. That's something that a Jew could keep, even a Gentile if he wanted to, but it was not binding. That, that's what he's referring to. There were Sabbaths that were connected to the feasts. New moon, food, drink, all of these things were part of the ceremonial law. Those things are no longer binding, but that is not referring to the fourth moral commandment. He can't be referring to that for several reasons. Now, here's the positive argument. We've already seen that Jesus declares himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. He corrected it, but he never abolished it. You know, he corrected all the, uh, the Pharisees' views on all the other commandments as well, didn't he? He spoke of all of them. Some, you know, I, I've, I've heard some say, and I'm not going to mention names because I do respect the, the individual who says this, but he says, you know, Jesus in, in the New Covenant or in, in the New Testament in his ministry, he speaks about all the other commandments but not the Sabbath. And I'm thinking, what? I mean, that's the one he spoke about more than any other. But whenever he spoke of the commandments, he was always correcting the Pharisees. It doesn't mean that, that that has abolished the commandments. He's just trying to lift the commandments back up to where they were before because the Pharisees, you know, they brought them down to a level where they could actually keep them. Just think of the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, and so first of all, note that Jesus kept it. 
And he enforced it, declared himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. But then he told his apostles, he told the church, as he was sending them out to make disciples of the nations, that they were to teach them to observe everything that he had commanded them. Notice that I, I used that argument in a paper in a dispensational college, you know, because that college did not believe the Ten Commandments are still in force. I'm thinking, well, hey, which of these commandments can you break, you know? They have to be enforced, and they'd say no. But I said, doesn't Jesus say, you know, and their argument is, well, Jesus was speaking to Jews, and so this only applies to Jews. But, I, but didn't Jesus send his disciples out to make disciples of all the nations, the Gentiles? And didn't he tell his disciples to teach them to observe all that I commanded you? Isn't that take up everything that Jesus said to the Jews and also bring it to the Gentiles? There aren't two churches. There's only one. So the standard remained the same. They were to do the, exactly the same thing that Jesus had commanded them. They were to teach them to do the same. And I believe that includes the Sabbath, which again, Jesus spoke about more than any other commandment. Now, he further said in the Sermon on the Mount that all the moral commandments, they are still binding and they will be binding as long as heaven and earth remain. Think about Matthew 5, verses 17 through 18. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, I know that some look at that, all is accomplished, and they, they, they think, well, that Jesus here is talking about, until my work is done, all of this remains in force. He's not talking just about his work. He's talking about everything, everything that God has planned, until all of it is accomplished. As long as heaven and earth remain, these things will remain. Now, why do, do I think that's the case? Well, he goes on to say in verse 19, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about his kingdom, the people who are in the kingdom of heaven through faith in him. If, if you will annul the least of these commandments and teach others, you will be called least in the kingdom, but whoever keeps and teaches them, teach others to do these things. It's what we're doing right now, right? He should be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So we want to maintain the standard and we want to encourage people to, to keep it as members of the kingdom of, of heaven. Now, consider also the blessing of the new covenant. I've referred to this several times, okay? In the new covenant, remember the new covenant was meant to fix the problem of the old covenant. And what was the problem of the old covenant? The problem was if, if I, let's say in the old covenant, let's say I engrave the Ten Commandments on the wall, okay? And I say to you, keep them. <laughs> My putting them on the wall does not give you the power to keep them. And when God engraved them in the stone tablets and he told his people to keep them, it didn't give them the ability to do it either. And subsequently, most of them didn't. And that was the problem. They did not continue in my covenant. And I did not care for them, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant that I'm going to make with the house of Israel and, of course, the Gentiles as well through faith in Christ. I'm, I'm going to put my laws in their minds and I'm going to write them on their hearts. And they shall be my people, I shall be their God. Okay? The Holy Spirit that he has given to us has, you know, not literally written them on our hearts. If you had open heart surgery, you wouldn't see the Ten Commandments listed there. But he has in our hearts, in our, you know, our affections, the same commandments that Israel broke are the same commandments that he has written on our hearts, the ones he's given us the power to keep, and that includes the Sabbath. We want to keep them. You see, the problem is Israel didn't want to keep them. The blessing of the new covenant is now we want to keep them. Now, I already mentioned before that God told us in Isaiah that the Sabbath would continue into the new covenant. Let me give you one example, Isaiah 56, verses 4 and 5. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant... To them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. 
I will give them an everlasting name, which will not be cut off. Now, why is that significant? Well, as you know, in the Old Covenant, eunuchs were excluded from the assembly of the Lord because of their, you know, the, the, the operation they underwent, okay? This is talking about the time when eunuchs will be brought into the assembly of the Lord. It's talking about the new covenant. And when that takes place, God pronounces a blessing on the eunuchs who, keeps, who keep his Sabbaths. He goes on to talk about the foreigners as, as well, that they would be blessed. So the old covenant looks forward to the new covenant and tells us the Sabbath would continue. Jesus, in the uh, Olivet Discourse, when he's warning about 70 AD and what was coming, and he told them, you need to be watching, you need to be ready, by the way, because they were going to see it. Okay, how do we know that the Olivet Discourse was not talking about our day or still future from our perspective? How do we know it referred to them and their day? It's because Jesus said, you be ready. You be ready to get out of Jerusalem when you see it surrounded, when you see the abomination of desolation and so forth. But he also said this to them, but pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. Jesus, in what would the time frame be, around 30 AD, is looking forward to 70 AD, because that's the time frame in which he is referring. But it doesn't really matter if it's 70 or if it's future from our perspective. It's still the future. He's telling his disciples, pray that it's not on Sabbath day, because you'd be caught unawares and not ready to flee out of the country. You'd be resting and worshiping on that particular day. But the Sabbath was still continuing. Now, we read in our meditation that the Sabbath continues because the possibility of entering into God's rest continues through the work of Christ. In Hebrews 4, verses 9 through 10, there remains, there, there remains a Sabbath rest, the keeping of a Sabbath day for the people of God, for the one who has entered his rest, that is, Christ has rested, him, has himself also rested from his works as God did from his I already mentioned the Sabbath is a picture of the rest that is ahead of us in heaven that God holds out to us every week so that we'll remember what it is we are aiming toward. Now, let me also mention that in the New Covenant, worship and rest are not things that become irrelevant, right? I mean, you needed rest in the Old Testament. You needed a day to worship in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, you don't need that. Uh, you don't need rest. You don't need a day for worship. Well, not really. The day, we still need it. We need a day that's the same for all of us so that we can all gather together to worship the Lord, which is what we're commanded to do in the new covenant. The author to the Hebrews writes, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So the Sabbath continues. We should note that there has been a change, though, and the change is the day that we are to observe it. The original Sabbath commemorated the completion of the old creation and God's ceasing from his works. He worked six days, rested on the seventh, blessed the Sabbath day, and made it holy. That creation was destroyed by sin. That's the reason why Paul refers to it as groaning and travailing, waiting for the revelation of the children of God when it will be set free from that corruption as well. So God created, sin destroyed the creation, but in Christ, it's, it's been recreated. Okay? Christ is the new creation. He, his work is the basis upon which the new heavens and the new earth will come and it's the reason why when we trust in Jesus Christ and we are in Christ, we are new creatures because we're a part of the new creation. Paul writes in Colossians 1, verses 19 and 20, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. The Christian Sabbath commemorates that work of the new creation. 
Remember, I, I quoted this a couple of times, one more time, the author to the Hebrews. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Okay, the, the Puritans saw this passage as referring to the work of Christ when he completed his work and he was raised from the dead, that's when he entered into his rest, not while he was under the power of death, but after he was released from death. And that is the day that we celebrate, the, commemorate the, the completion of the work of the new creation, the rest of Christ, which allows us ultimately through faith in him to enter into. And that's why we see the disciples worshiping on the first day of the week. Here's one example from Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Now, it has been noted that the early Christians also went to synagogue. They worshiped two days a week, okay? But the reason why they went to the synagogue was so that they could tell the Jews there about Christ. They went there to evangelize, but they met together on the first day of the week for worship. So now there are those who argue that the commandment requires, the commandment itself, the fourth commandment requires that we worship on Saturday. And they say, how do you get around this? You ever talk to a Seventh-day Adventist? They have some pretty choice things to say about people who worship on the first day of the week. They believe we're, we're Sabbath breakers and some of them that we have the mark of the beast because we're worshiping on Sunday, and they would say, if you worship on Sunday, you can't be saved. Now, I'm not sure that all Seventh-day Adventists believe that anymore, but that used to be their standard teaching, okay? And I think there's also some Seventh-day Baptists, but I'm not putting down the Baptists. They, there's probably a, there's so many different Baptist denominations, you probably can find one that believes just about anything. So why, what's that? Yeah. So why do we not agree with them on this? And it's because the commandment itself doesn't really specify a day of the week. I want you to see that. When it says work six days and rest on the seventh, it doesn't say work the first six days of the week and rest on the seventh day of the week. It says work six days and rest on the seventh. It's giving to us a sequence, okay? Working, a sequence of working six days and of resting on the seventh day, but it doesn't tell us, by the way, I can, I can thank Jonathan Edwards for this insight, it doesn't tell us where the sequence begins or where it ends. God has to show us outside of the commandment. Now, we know he showed at the very beginning, it was at the end of the creation week. But after he brought his people out of Egypt, it was the seventh day after he began to give them manna. And in the new covenant, it's the day of Christ's resurrection. So our call to worship reminds us that God actually has changed the day, and he was intending to do that. Even in the old covenant, he prophesied that it would be the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Remember Psalm 118, 22 through 24, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That was the day of his resurrection. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And that's exactly what we do in the new covenant. It's what we see the new covenant church actually doing. And what they're doing is they're celebrating that day of worship and rest on the day of Christ's resurrection rather than on the seventh day that the Jews were worshiping him. Now, the last question we need to ask is this, how are we to observe this day? Well, we're to do it the way Jesus did it, okay, and the way he taught. You know, again, it, it's, we should assume he did it the right way because he had to fulfill all righteousness, but we also take into account his corrections, right? Now, the commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So first of all, we need to remember it because we often forget it. We often set it aside. But that, that's a problem with the first commandment. I want us to see, why would we set aside the fourth commandment? Now, we might do it because we don't think the fourth commandment is, is binding. But if we're convinced that it is, we have to remember it. If, if we don't, then whatever it is we're laying that aside to do is something we actually think more highly of than God. 
maybe it's our pleasure or whatever it might be, you know. That's usually what people do. Do you know that some churches have worship service on Saturday evening so they can clear Sunday so they can just have fun and do their whatever they want to do? It's just completely the opposite of what the Lord wants us to do. Our keeping of this day is our declaration that Jesus has risen from the dead. But we don't, we don't want to put the Sabbath aside for anything because, again, that's put, elevating that thing above God. Okay? So God wants us to remember it. Even his people had a hard time remembering this because of sin. Secondly, we need to remember it's a Sabbath day, okay? not a Sabbath hour. We need to rest the whole day. And the reason is that we might worship God. We might worship in public. We might, you know, keep, uh, spend time in fellowship. And that really gets us into the third reason. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember how God sanctified the Sabbath because he rested on that day? He wants us to sanctify it. That's what it means to keep it holy. That means to set it apart from, from secular use to sacred use, to set it apart for God's use. So again, God has given us this day for a specific reason, to rest from our work so that we can meet publicly, we can be fed by the means of grace, together we can seek His face of blessing and, and hopefully by His grace find it, but we can fellowship together, we can minister to each other, we need this day. By the way, have you ever asked yourself why some churches have two, two services on a Sunday and others don't? That's a long-standing tradition that comes from a Sabbatarian position. Why, why have two when you can have one? Well, the reason why the Puritans had two and the reason why they went you know, pretty long, by our standards, uh, we, we'd have a hard time in, you know, actually being able to endure that, which is kind of sad, but... It's true, and I would have a difficulty as well, you know, just being able to keep up with that much activity. Some, some had services that lasted for six hours, okay? But the reason why they had to was because they believed that this, the Christian Sabbath was a day of rest and a day of worship, a day that we are to sanctify, and they knew how difficult it was for people to do that if they tried to do it on their own. So they had two worship services, so they would have something to occupy their time doing what it is they should be doing on this day, worshiping the Lord, singing hymns and psalms and, and hearing the word read and preached so that it would be profitable for them. So that this market day, they, they'd come back home, as it were, with a full load and to be able to feed off of that for the remaining days. Well, that's why we have two services on the Lord's Day. It, it's, it, you know, it... Sometimes I look at the, at the churches that have one service, and I think, man, it'd be easy to have just the one service because you have half as much work, unless we're having a video in the evening, that cuts down the work somewhat. But when you have to prepare two sermons, that, that's twice as much work, you know. But it helps God's people, and it helps us sanctify the Lord's Day, and that's why we've kept it up all these years. Okay, so... We're to, we're to remember the Sabbath day, the whole day, to keep it holy. And on this day, remember the commandment says, in it you shall not do any work. Okay, now the Jews took that absolutely. But we do know that Jesus made some exceptions to that. We are not to do any unnecessary work on this day. Work that can be done on another day. But there are some things that can't be done on another day. Okay. Uh, when Jesus was traveling with the disciples, they needed food. And so they picked the heads of grain. And the Jews pointed at the disciples. They said, look, your disciples are breaking the Sabbath. And, and then he goes on to say, well, you know, as, as uh, David ate the, the showbread and his men, which wasn't lawful for anyone but the priests, and they weren't guilty because it was necessary. Okay? You can do work that really is necessary to preserve life on the Lord's Day. We can prepare food. We can feed ourselves. And what if somebody gets hit by a car on the Sabbath, you know, on the, Christian, on the Lord's Day? Do you just let them bleed out on the street? No, you, you call the ambulance or you, you, maybe you go and try to help them first yourself and you call the ambulance to get help. Jesus saw a man with a withered hand in the synagogue and he healed him. And again, the Jews accused him. But he said, hey, you know, if your donkey fell in a ditch, wouldn't you help the donkey? Aren't you going to help a man? 
I made him whole. You're going to accuse me of breaking the Sabbath because I made him whole on the Sabbath. We can help people, okay? We can minister to them. We can also evangelize. We can save people from destruction. You know, if we can help their physical bodies, we can help their souls as well. So we are to set aside our work and not do unnecessary work so that we can rest. And here's another one that perhaps we don't often think about, but we we should really do our best not to make other people work, to make them serve us. You know, the commandment says explicitly, in it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, your cattle, your sojourner who stays with you. You know, don't, don't hook up your dog to your bicycle and make him, you know, <laughs> make him your motor. Anyway, you, you've got to give everything a rest, you know, that, that's alive. So we need to be very careful. Now, Jesus kept the Sabbath again because he loved his father. He wanted to spend time with his father. Um, if, if we ever hope to, to grow in our love for the Lord, that takes time. If, if you don't spend time with the Lord, if you don't read his word, if you don't pray, if you don't worship, if you don't come to public worship, if you don't keep his Sabbaths, which is a whole day to do this, you, you can't. Grow in your love for the Lord. By the way, we need to walk with Him all during the week as well. Be thinking His thoughts, making choices, you know, serving Him. We have to be, the more time we spend with Him, the more we're going to be like Him. That is so very important for our spiritual growth. But this day, the reason why God gave us this day is because He loves us and He wants us to grow. And I've always said this at the end of all these Sabbath sermons that I've done in the past. Even if we, we were convinced from Scripture that, that God did not intend for us to keep a Sabbath day, if our hearts are right with the Lord, we would say, that's too bad because I could really use a day like that. I should want a day like that. And instead of saying, you know, in, in our hearts, I wish I didn't have to give this day to the Lord. I wish I could just do what I want to do. Our, really, our heart should be this. I wish every day were the Sabbath so I could spend it in worship. And I could spend it with God's people, and I could serve and honor Him in this way. Do you know our sister Shirley Nicolay has entered into what's called the eternal Sabbath, the eternal rest, and every day is a day of worship for her. And she loves it because that's what she's wanted her whole life. And that's what we should want as believers. So if we don't want that, let, you know, that's why I say the, 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 the Sabbath day, the Christian Sabbath, the Lord's day, whatever you choose to call it, it's like a spiritual thermometer, isn't it? it? It tells you where you're at spiritually. If I'm thinking, I don't want to go to church, you know, well, there's a problem with that, isn't there? There's a problem with my heart that needs to be corrected. But if I'm saying, you know, I, I love this day and I would like other days like this, well, then we've got the right kind of heart. The the Sabbath is not a burden. None of the commandments are a burden to those who love God, right? Because they show us how to love Him and how to love our neighbor as ourselves. Well, let's let's bow in a moment of prayer. Sorry I was so long-winded, but um, in this case, I wanted to get it all out at one time. But um, let's just think through these things. And, And again, remember the purpose of it. It's not legalism. It's not to make myself righteous by him doing this, but God has given it to us as a gift. He knows that we need it. So let's try to use it for that purpose that we might grow more into the image of Christ. So let's, let's spend a few moments in prayer.